Hi, this is Pastor Bob Yandy, and I'm beginning a series of teaching this week today on the Bible and national defense, what the Word of God has to say about fighting for your nation, how God will back fighting for your nation, and why it's still scriptural today. So join me today in the Word of God for the Bible and national defense. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and study the Word of God with Bob Yandian. Hello, this is Pastor Bob Yandy, and welcome again to the Student of the Word. Glad you're here with us this week. I'm going to be taking up mainly this week, almost all week, and perhaps the whole week, on the subject of what the Bible has to say about national defense. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because we see so many wars going on. They just keep on increasing until Jesus comes back. And then the greatest battle yet to be fought on this entire earth has ever been fought will be the Battle of Armageddon. And Jesus Christ will head that up. And what in the meantime, what does the Bible say about national defense? What should we do? And uh, pastors don't know how to approach it. That you know, the, the problem comes is if you stay the word of God, you become very conservative. You know, it's I, I look at this way. You can be liberal and be saved, but you cannot be a disciple and be a liberal. There's just no way you can do that because when the Bible begins to shape your thinking, it's possible to be born again and still not have your mind renewed by the word of God or have the mind of Christ. When you're first born again, all you know is Jesus is Lord, and the rest of that is you have the mind of Bob or the mind of Bill or the mind of Mary. But God wants to replace that with the mind of Christ, and that's where the word comes in. So the more you study the word of God, you begin to find out the importance of national defense. But sometimes those emotional issues come in. But what about life? And what about killing? Is killing correct? We're going to be answering all that during this week. And it comes from the book I have written on the Bible and national defense. It all comes from the word of God. But I just want you to point out I do in our day, the day we live in, and yet the days that are to come. And so war is just something that's always been since the time of the fall. And a nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, Jesus prophesied to this. In fact, that's where we're going to go to. If you want to go ahead and open up to Matthew chapter 24, we're going to take a look at verses 4 through 8. These five verses just really describe the church age we're living in, even though it doesn't call it the church age. And then verse 9 will begin the tribulation. But these these five verses here will just deal with the time period we're living in. And uh, so much is so true about that. But anyway, what does the Word of God have to say? For a number of days, we're going to be taking up this week and going through things about, well, what about thou shalt not kill? And and, and what about killing in, in, in case of battle? And, and what do I do, you know, uh, about as far as being in the military? And what about uh, conscientious objectors, people that don't want to go to war and they use the Bible as their defense. Well, we'll go into it and find out what the Word of God has to say. But in the meantime, let's get into the Word of God. And also, again, my book is being offered. And believe me, uh, this book has just been such a... I enjoyed writing it, even though it was controversial at the time because it was written during a great time of peace. At a time of peace, people think, well, look, we have revival going on and churches growing and people getting saved. And why do we need something on national defense? Because the devil hasn't been put away yet. He will. Once the Prince of Peace comes back and Satan's removed from this earth, who is the chief core of war, and then the curse on the earth removed, then we'll move into a time of eternal peace. And so we'll see that later again in this particular teaching. Open with you in Matthew chapter 24. Let's take a look beginning in verse 4. We're going to read down through verse 8. Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no man deceive. You might as well underline, take heed, let no one deceive you. Say, well, I'm not going to be deceived. Well, this is going to talk about war. It's going to mean, it means people come to you and say, well, we can do away with war. If we just have peace with all nations, sit down and discuss our problems, we're going to have peace. No, we still have the nature of the flesh. We have Satan out there and we have the curse on the earth. And so until the time that Jesus comes back, we're going to have war. So take a look at verse four again. Jesus answered, said to them, take heed that no one deceive Deceive you, for many will come in my name, saying, "I am Christ," and will deceive many. We're living in a day more and more where more people are coming out saying, "This is the way to salvation," and people saying, "I have the right way," and people even thinking, "Well, if I my own love and my own concern for people will get me into heaven." No, there's going to be people coming saying, "I am Christ," and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Wars are hot wars. And rumors of wars are cold wars. We've been through a time in our own country with America and Russia in those times of the cold wars. 
And then the Russian empire basically fell. And now we've seen it coming back again. And we're getting moving into a time there's talk about we could move back into a time of cold wars. That's called rumors of wars here. It goes on to say, see that you're not troubled. In the midst of all that's going on around us, as we see mounting and mounting problems in nations around us, it says, don't be troubled. Why? Because my trust, even though I am here, is somewhat in the American military. My ultimate trust is in God himself and in Jesus Christ, who has the greatest army of all, and Jesus is the chief leader of it. It goes on to say, look at this verse again, verse six, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. What's gonna happen during this time where he goes on to say here, all these things must come to pass? Well, verse seven, he emphasizes war again, where he said, you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. Nation will rise against nation. We're seeing this happening around the world today with a Russia, the Ukraine, and other nations that have risen up, all these things that are happening around us. It goes on to say, you'll see nation rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Notice two things. Nation against nation is two individual countries, but kingdom against kingdom is actually the forces behind the nation. And kingdom against kingdom is always Satan's kingdom versus God's kingdom. There's always a core to war. It's not just this nation decided to attack this nation. Once it begins to come out, we probably won't know till we get to heaven, all the reasons behind every war, but we're going to find out it really came back to basically the love of money, which started in the heart of Satan, where the Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil, which means the fall of Lucifer was over the love of money because of the abundance of merchandise. We're told in the word of God, in Ezekiel, where his fall came, the abundance of your merchandise, they have filled the midst of your heart with violence and you've sinned. So the love of money started. And if you find it today, as people have often said, if you want to find the problem, follow the money trail. And that's in government, that's in business. Whenever people try to take over one thing, it always comes down to money. And this is the purpose that nations that want to control all the money of the world. Thus, as they can see, they control the world. Verse seven again says, for nation will rise against nation and and behind the scenes, it's kingdom against kingdom, satanic kingdom and religious kingdoms against God's kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilences, earthquakes. This sound familiar in various places, but notice verse eight, all these are the beginnings of sorrow. Notice again, where Jesus said, all these things must come to pass at the end of verse six, but the end is not yet. We're seeing these things escalate and escalate. And every day people say, oh, Jesus is coming any minute. He may not. We don't know exactly when he's coming, but we do know these things. These are indicators. It's getting closer every single day. Well, I think we're in the last days. You know when the last days started? On the day of Pentecost. When Peter quoted Joel's prophecy, he said it'll come to pass in the last days. The last days began on the day of Pentecost. It's emphasized in the book of Timothy, both first and second Timothy. And then it talks about at the end of the time we're living in. So we are actually coming down to the end, the last of the last days. But even then he said, don't expect it today. Don't expect it tomorrow. He says, be anticipating it, but understand this. He said, the end is not yet. And what do we see today? He goes on to say here in this verse of scripture, he says, there'll be false Christ, false prophets rising up. And boy, are we getting false prophets everywhere. People pr predicting things and saying the Lord's about to, the Lord's about to, God's about to do this. It doesn't happen and they're on to something else. And it simply comes down to this. In the Old Testament, prophets that prophesied of these things were supposed to, even if it didn't come to pass, they were to be killed. That's what happened. If they prophesied something and it didn't happen, they were to be killed. In the New Testament, we find out there's more leeway in there, but the point of it is, if it's a prophet, it should come to pass. Sometimes it doesn't come to pass exactly every little, you know, a jot and tittle of what they said come to pass, but the overall thing does come to pass. But we're finding today that none of it's coming. I mean, people are speaking out these things and none of it he says, you're gonna see these things multiply around you. Then you're going to see wars and rumors of wars. He says, but you must understand at the end of verse six, these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. What is part of the things that must come to pass? Wars and rumors of wars. You can't get rid of them. We can't legislate them away. We can't sit down and have enough peace treaties with nations because people often and nations will lie. And then later on, whenever it comes time for them to back their promises, they just don't do it. They sit back with their hands folded, say, we're not going to do that. Oh, I know we signed that paper, but that was 15 years ago, 20 years ago. We're not going to come through and defend you. 
And so we find that the word of man is flawed, but the word of God is not. Look at verse eight. All these are the beginnings of sorrows. So you can underline the word sorrows and make a note beside it, or else just pull your pad out and make a, a note on it. That word sorrows appears also in Romans chapter eight. And this is the word for birth pangs. All these things you see happening around you are the beginning of birth pangs. It simply says this, the baby's not here yet, but you know the baby's on the way. You don't know the exact day, the exact time that baby's gonna come, but all these birth pangs, you know, all these you know, contractions that we see going around the earth, well, what are the contractions? Famines, pestilence, earthquakes, wars, rumors of wars, uh, false prophets rising up more and more and more and more indicates we're getting closer to the time of the birth and the, it's simply saying here in this verse of scripture that the earth is pregnant and the earth is pregnant, not with something evil. I mean, the birth pains that come along might be the evils that are happening in this earth, but something good's gonna happen at the end of it. And that will be the birth of the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. A thousand years of peace on the earth, headed up by Jesus Christ himself. Talk about a great time. Not only will the wondrous things of God come in, but the, the curses of Satan will be removed. Satan will be removed. Demons will be removed. Fallen angels will be removed. The false prophet, the beast, the antichrist will all be removed. Religion will be taken off the face of the earth. All unbelievers will be taken off the face of the earth. And that even the, the curse that was put here at the time of Adam will be removed. And the Bible says that the lamb will lay down with the lion and uh, the babies can pick up poisonous snakes. It will not hurt them. The trees will even clap their hands at the return of the Lord himself at that time to establish his nation, establish his kingdom here on this earth. But in the meantime, national defense occupies a major part of the word of God. Old Testament knew. Why? Because since the fall of Adam, war has entered into this earth as evil and the nature of the flesh and backed by demons and backed by Satan comes on dictators and then keeps pushing them to gain more and more and steal land, uh, steal possessions, kill people, rape the women's uh, Ch uh, you know, kill children, put them into slavery, all the different things they do that is so much against the word of God. In the meantime, those things rise up and to sadly, they last for a period of time, but then the good thing happens is war comes along and destroys us. There is absolutely a perfect time for, the, for war to occur and war can be of God. It's a means of cleansing until the time of Jesus Christ himself going to come back. Notice again what, what uh, Jesus said, see to it that no man mislead you. That's in verse four. In verse six, you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. Verse seven, nation will rise up against nation. These things must come to pass. And then in verse eight, this is just the beginning of birth pangs in the earth. So again, we find out, in fact, Romans chapter, if you ever have a time to do that, it simply points out that even we as Christians, because we have a natural body, we go through birth pangs. We go through troubles and trials like the earth does. We're pregnant with a resurrection body. The earth goes through the same things, but it's pre pregnant with the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll take up more of this when we come back and be sure and get a copy of this book. In fact, two or three copies, especially if your children are in the military or friends are in the military and send them a copy of the book. See you right after the break. What does the Bible have to say about war and the price of our freedom? Should Christians fight to defend their country? Is world peace even possible? In the Bible and National Defense, Bob Yandian discusses the Bible's answer to these questions, as well as how we, as Christians, are to pray for our nation and our leaders. Topics include the purpose of government, crime and immorality, capital punishment, separation of church and state, and freedom and war. The strength of a nation is the people of God. By prayer and applying God's word, we can make a difference. To order the Bible and National Defense, visit our website at bobyendian.com. Theology Simplified is a practical guide to foundational biblical truth. Basic doctrines are not difficult, but easy to understand. They often become disguised as complicated or deep sounding words, but the definitions are simple. Using straightforward vocabulary and down-to-earth examples, Pastor Bob makes complex theological concepts clear and practical. Eight crucial doctrines of the Christian faith are demystified. Redemption, justification, sanctification, reconciliation, predestination, election, 
propitiation, and glorification. These eight precepts, essential for all believers to understand, come to light as you read and arrive at a deeper understanding of the finished work of Jesus Christ. To order Theology Simplified, visit our website at bobyandian.com. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on partnership. Until the day that Jesus Christ comes back, we are going to have wars and rumors of wars. Jesus said this, Matthew chapter 24, he said, you will hear wars, rumors of wars. These things must come to pass. But wars will be here until the time Jesus comes back and the war that he's going to bring on this earth at the Battle of Armageddon will eclipse all wars up until the, this will be the worst battle ever fought, but it's gonna be the war to end all wars. And again, when he comes back, all war will finally on that day be abolished and all weapons will be destroyed. Look at Isaiah chapter two and verse four. I think this is interesting because this verse is on the outside of the United Nations building and there couldn't be a worse example of pulling a verse out of context that the United Nations and me people coming together is going to accomplish this verse. Nations coming together is nothing more than the Tower of Babel that happened in the Old Testament. Nations cannot remedy nation's problems any more than an individual can get rid of his individual problems without the work of God. It takes a divine intervention into your life for you to become acceptable to God and you really be able to conquer sin. Until that time, you're just fooling yourself to think that you can help yourself or by getting a group of people around us, we can all support each other and somehow we can all get better. No, we also blend each other's weaknesses and sins and problems together. That's what happens with nations. When nations get together and their purpose is peace, that's fine, to, but to accomplish it, you need the help of God. And Isaiah 2, 4 says this, this will finally happen one day. Industry will no longer manufacture weapons. Isaiah 2, 4, it says he will judge between the nations. This is when Jesus Christ comes back and rebuke many people. On that day, look what happens. They will beat their swords into plowshares. In other words, instead of a national economy having a huge part of it, uh, bringing an income and also needing expenses for times of war, war will be over. At that time, you can take your tanks, you can take your military uh, ma machines, their might, all the weapons, all the planes, all the things and melt them down and turn them into what? Plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. In other words, we're gonna go back to an agriculturally economy and people will be raising food. In other words, during that time, people often say the earth can't support that many people. Yes, it can. There is so much land in this world. And you notice what? Land replenishes itself. You know, the reason we throw uh, down fertilizer on the ground is because we don't let the land rest every seven years to replenish itself. So we replenish it. All right. But in the olden days, back in the Old Testament, before they had all that stuff, God said, let the land rest every seven years. You know what that means? The, the earth can replenish itself for the things we exhaust out of it, if we'll leave it alone for a year, it can, in one year, it can replenish itself. And so in that day, the economy of the world will go back to what comes from the ground. And so we'll beat all of these swords and we'll beat all our spears into plowshares and pruning hooks. And then it goes on to say, nation will not lift up sword against nation, neither will they learn war any more. But that's at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But what about until that day? Here's a verse we don't hear. And they certainly don't put this one on the outside of the UN building. It's the opposite of that. Look at Joel chapter three. And look at verse nine and 10. You see, Isaiah 2, 4 that we just quoted is when Jesus comes back to rule and reign. But Joel chapter three tells us in the meantime, what are we supposed to do? What should be our economy? Say, well, let's just take all of our weapons and all this, let's just melt it down and let's accomplish that verse. No, Jesus will accomplish that verse. Here's what we're to do in the meantime. Joel chapter three, verses nine and 10. Proclaim this among the nations. Wake up, America. Wake up, other nations. You need to proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for war.
Wake up the mighty men. This is your military. Let all the men of war draw near and let them come up. Notice this, beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears, right? Not simply telling you take some of the, the income that you're putting in here uh, toward your, you know, toward uh, farming and agriculture and all this kind of stuff and, and having the economy go. You need to pull part of that out there and take this, what normally has been set for plowshares and pruning hooks and turn them into swords and spears until the day that we can turn our swords into plowshares and our spears back into pruning hooks. Then it goes on to say, let the weak say, I am strong. We need to look to weapons around us to help our military strength, but still going to come back to this. We still need God's help. And we'll talk about that. But listen, I'm talking about in the meantime, war is necessary. There's going to be war and there's preparation for war. And that's what this whole teaching is going to be about this entire week. Next of all, again, Man will never bring a lasting peace during the church age. It's going to be temporary peace. Any peace that man can have during the tribulation and the millennium will be the time when Jesus can do it. That's when lasting peace will come. But peace is purchased in the meantime through military victory. Until Jesus comes back, any peace that happens in this earth is going to come by military might and military victory. Again, my hat's off. I salute you guys that are in the military today. Those of you that are veterans that have come out and you're around today, thank you so much. There may be a few out there still alive from World War II. Thank you. My dad fought in World War II. He's gone on to be with the Lord. And the stories he told about people coming together, but also he had prayers during that time. There was twice he was in a B-17. He had 33 missions he flew into Germany out of England, but twice the plane almost didn't make it back across the English Channel. My dad prayed and didn't know God was not saved, but even promised God, if you'll just get me back to the United States, I will go to church. Well, God got him back to the United States and he didn't go to church. And in fact, it took a while before finding the gospel crossed his path and he accepted Jesus Christ, but it wasn't in a church. So here's the point. Peace is always until the time that Jesus comes back, purchased through military victory. There's times we're going to have peace and we're going to times we're going to have war. And that's prophets. That's also told us again in the Old Testament. In the book of Proverbs, in the book of Ecclesiastes tells us a time of peace, a time of war. But Jesus, the Prince of Peace, will finally bring eternal peace. In the meantime, winning wars can only be bringing a temporary peace. Only God can bring a lasting peace. Man cannot bring lasting peace. But winning wars only brings a temporary peace. And you might as well plan on it. When peace comes, begin to build up your weapons again, because there's going to come a time when the evil that's in this earth will manifest itself in one core place or two core places, and those are going to decide they're going to conquer the known world uh, around them. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, will finally one day bring eternal peace after the worst war that the world has ever seen on earth. Until then, we need to train our children in war. I know what you're thinking. No, I don't believe that. I believe that we should raise our children in peace and let them walk in peace. Listen, that's toward people to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. But when it comes to the nations around us, we need to rise up and we need to train for that time when we may be needed to fight in war. Look at Judges chapter three. This was after the wars of the book of Joshua, and after Joshua fought, there were still some nations that were alive. God told them to kill everybody, but some were left. And we find out here that even though they should have killed them, God took the opportunity and used it with the nations that remained to teach a lesson. Judges chapter three, verses one and two says this. Now, these are the nations which the Lord left that he might test Israel by them. That is, all who had not known any of the wars in Canaan. Notice this verse two. This was so the generations of the children of Israel might be taught to know about war, at least those who had not formerly known it. In other words, what this verse is saying is that when the wars were over, you need to start training this next generation because wars will be coming along. How do you train them? You take men and women who have fought in a war and they start training those who are under them. The older teaching the younger, which has always been throughout the word of God. The elders, those that are older in the nation have gone through those things, have learned some things. And if we, if the younger will listen to them, they can save you a lot of time in not having to reinvent the wheel that they, you can come back and find fight and defend your nation. Universal military training is not only taught the word of God, it is commanded. And there's no such thing in the Bible as a volunteer army. I know that America has a volunteer army. I came up during the time whenever we had the draft. 
and my number came up. And so I, anyway, I went, but I had something uh, physically wrong with me, and it, so they wouldn't take me in. I kind of wish I could have gone in and at least, you know, helped with, with uh, you know, papers and, and, and typing and all the other stuff I could have done and helping planning and stuff with, without having to actually into combat, but I didn't go. But I know from the Word of God, you know, I, I, there's times I know I could have learned some things. I've learned them since then through the Word of God and following Him, but just, you know, just personal things in my life, personal disciplines, how to handle people. People, how to handle, you know, uh, adversity in life. A lot of this can come, and really, a lot of growing up quickly can happen when you get into the military. Universal military training, again, in the Bible is commanded, and there was no such thing in the Bible as a volunteer army. Everyone had to go. That's still true in Israel today. My wife and I have been on a number of trips, taking church uh, people with us, and when we get there, we find the streets are filled with with uh, kids. Why well, I have to call them kids? They're just late teens. I mean, 19, 20, uh, those ages in the streets girls and boys and on tops of buildings and everything with rifles in their hands and, and, and automatic weapons in their hands. These are things, and you know what? It doesn't make you look at that and go, oh, those poor kids. And oh, these people are learning, you know, national defense. Ooh, this isn't good. No, we felt protected. There was a peace in the streets that you know that if everybody, somebody wants, they're gonna have to come through those people who are trained before they finally get to us. And this is what the military does. It stands between the general population of a nation and those out there that want to have war. They stand between it. And this is what God wants to train us in, in, in our own nation. We need to be helping raising up a new generation to understand where we've come from because they're not getting it in school. They're not getting our past history in school, but yet the military can teach them this. The military can go all the way back to where we began, talk about the wars we have come through, and a good military will always tell you, this, look, this one looked impossible, but somehow we came through it. It must have been the hand of God. We're gonna talk about that because God does back just wars. Okay, there may be unjust wars that we see out there, but he backs just wars. In fact, he will be the author of the greatest just war of all, and that will be Jesus Christ coming back at the Battle of Armageddon. So again, perhaps, Pastor, you've been wondering how you can help your with national defense. How do you help from your church? Help recruit godly soldiers. Teach on it. I mean, you don't have to teach a whole series on this, but you might take a Sunday where you talk about the importance of it and then recruiting from your own congregation young men to go and sign up for national defense. This is because, in fact, I believe this is a core of the church to help raise up godly soldiers, help recruit godly soldiers. War has always been a part of history and will continue to be a part of history while Satan is the god of this world. Ecclesiastes 3.8 tells us this, there is a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. As surely as there are proper times to love and a proper times to have a godly hatred toward the things of Satan, there's also a time when we fight wars and there's also a time of peace. And in closing, before we come back tomorrow, Numbers chapter 21 and verse 14, God even keeps a record book of just wars. Numbers 21 and verse 14, it is said in the book of the wars of the Lord. Whenever a just war is fought, God records it and we'll probably pull this out in heaven. God keeps a record of wars that were just in this earth. So when it's the time to rise up and fight for your nation, when a war is just. And we're coming to that time period. If Jesus doesn't come back soon, we're gonna see some wars. And you know what? The best soldiers should be godly men and women of God who know the word of God, know how to stand on the word of God, and know how in a time of war to put our trust in God, that God will deliver us from all of our enemies. See you tomorrow. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. Visit bobyandian.com. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.